Hi everyone, thanks in advance for listening to my talk. My name is Chris Farrow and I am a PhD student working out of Dr. Ackerman's lab at the University of Guelph. I'll be discussing my research on the development and testing of an environmentally friendly tracer particle for dispersal studies. To begin, I'll discuss the ecological motivation for creating these tracer particles. Supply side ecology dictates that larval recruitment in benthic populations is determined by larval supply, which places hydrodynamics into context as an important determinant of larval transport and settlement. This can be seen mathematically since flow velocity is included in the equation for larval flux, which is the product of larval concentration and flow velocity. Substrate properties are also important as they mediate the local hydrodynamic conditions affecting settlement. So that begs the question of how the tracer particles will be used. They can be used as physical models to study hydrodynamically mediated dispersal processes. Experiments ideally use live organisms, but that's not always feasible as they are required in large quantities. Common alternatives to live organisms include non-biodegradable polymers or dead organisms. Unfortunately, these options can also be limiting as they can be damaging to the environment or in the case of dead organisms, they can still be difficult to obtain in sufficient quantities. A challenge, especially when developing a model for a microscopic organism, is that the particles should match the physical characteristics of the live organisms. This means that they should be similar in physical characteristics like size, density, and shape, hopefully while also being biodegradable and non-toxic so as not to harm the environment. For this application, the physical models were designed specifically after juvenile species at risk mussels. Due to their conservation status, these mussels are obviously difficult to acquire and policy generally limits live releases of aquacultured individuals. Furthermore, conventional non-biodegradable particles are not appropriate as they could damage habitat and cause further harm to the species we intend to protect. For those of you who are less familiar with native unionid mussels or their life cycle, the illustration below depicts their life cycle. Male adult mussels release sperm into the water column, which fertilizes the females. The fertile, fertilized females brood obligate parasitic larvae called glochidia on their gills. The glochidia are then eventually released onto the gills of their hosts, which are usually fish. And then the glochidia undergo metamorphosis on the gills of their hosts, eventually transforming into juvenile mussels that fall off onto the riverbed. Our lab has previously done some work on the transport of glochidia whereas this work focuses specifically on the transport and settlement of juveniles. Before making a physical model of juvenile unionids, we had to identify their physical characteristics we intend to replicate. We aim to make alginate microspheres according to the following data that were published on their physical characteristics. Glochidia have similar dimensions to recently existed juveniles and are approximately 280 microns high, 240 microns long, and their hinge is approximately 140 microns wide. Parameters used in previous modeling studies and the ones we settled upon for our particle morphology target were 250 micron spheres colored to enhance visibility and with a density of 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed. On the right is an example of a raid bean glochidia. Now to illustrate how I will use the microbeads, I've depicted an animation on this slide. So particles are released in the water column where the flow carries them downstream for collection in sedimentation traps or drift nets. And I'll present more details on how these collectors work on a following slide. In terms of matching the identified morphology target, the physical and chemical modifications had to be made to standard alginate beads. 
The first is for their size, which was closely matched to the identified size target, as you can see in the size frequency histogram to the right. To ensure their visibility in samples, we dyed them with riboflavin, which fluoresces under UV light. You can see that in the image to the right. We also encapsulate blueberry extract in other microbeads as it provides an alternative non-fluorescent color. When you acidify blueberry extract, it turns a bright red color, which can also assist with microbe microbead visibility. And lastly, we adjusted their density by diffusing glycerol water solutions of the correct density into the beads. The correct ratios of glycerol water are shown in the figure to the right, which are uh, between 60 to 80 glyc percent glycerol by weight in this case. Now to confirm that the microbeads were the correct density, we performed some preliminary settling velocity experiments in a 0.2 kilogram per meter per second glycerol water solution. This viscosity allows us to calculate the microbead density properly using Stokes' law. We compared the settling velocities of the alginate microbeads with a non-biodegradable standard, which was polyethylene spheres matched to the right density. The settling, settling velocities were approximately equal between the two spheres, and the calculated microbead density was approximately 1,200 kilograms per meter cubed. For the last physical properties of the microbeads, we had to ensure that they are not toxic and biodegradable. So to do so, we first performed a small scale toxicity uh, study on 120 quagga mussels. And in this case, none of the microspheres were toxic after 72 hour exposures. The treatments included riboflavin and blueberry loaded microspheres, as well as plain alginate microspheres and a no microbead control. We used microbead concentrations well above those that organisms in the field would be exposed to, just in order to provide a conservative estimate of their toxicity. And to confirm that the microbeads degrade, we deployed them in mesh bags for three weeks in the Aramasa River, which is a local river close to the University of Guelph campus. And the contents of the bag weighed approximately 60% of their initial weight after the three weeks passed. The bags were initially loaded with approximately 10,000 beads, and these were removed weekly from two locations. You can see me with a nice smile getting ready to collect the samples on the bottom right. After confirming the microbeads were not toxic and that they readily degrade in the field, we were able to conduct our first particle release experiments. We chose to perform these experiments at the Speed River, which is another local river. For later use in our modeling, we also collected riverbed elevation data at a 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter resolution. The colors in each of these elevation maps indicate high elevations in red and low elevations in blue. Now, as I mentioned before, we designed custom drift nets and sedimentation traps with some important design considerations in mind. The drift nets were designed to determine the horizontal flux of the microbeads, and they were also designed to minimize clogging, which is problematic for determining accurate estimates of particle flux. The sedimentation traps feature a novel design and were used to determine the flux of the particles to the riverbed. The sedimentation traps can measure flux over a natural substrate as the black tray pictured on the right can be filled with substrate from the river and can be removed to flush the settled particles into the collection bucket at the end. The process of collecting the particles is sort of like panning for gold. Any particles we catch are counted and used to determine particle flux at each location. So to ensure our collection methods work, we conducted three preliminary particle release trials at the Speed River. We released 30,000 microbeads per release, which is a large number, but one that is required in order to obtain more reliable particle capture estimates. Drift nets and sedimentation traps were positioned two, four, 
8, 16, and 32 meters from the release point. And we simultaneously measured velocities with a flow tracker 2, acoustic Doppler velocimeter, and inline mechanical flow meters. You can see Emil measuring velocity with the ADV, or acoustic Doppler velocimeter, on the right. Although we captured a relatively small proportion of the microbeads, as you can see by looking at the scaling of the y-axis, that is common for release studies of this kind. The decline in particle capture with downstream distance was predicted well by power and negative exponential models. You can also see some of the successfully captured microbeads from the two meter net on the right. I was very pleased to see that the fluorescence was sustained after collecting the microbeads. It's important to note though, that these results were obtained at uncharacteristically high flow velocities and turbulence intensities, but we intend to increase our sample sizes in the next field season. We confirmed the microbeads are an acceptable environmentally friendly alternative to non-biodegradable microplastics. Our preliminary data suggests that the decline in microbead capture with downstream distance is similar to that expected for glochidia and juveniles. We only caught one microbead in a vertical sedimentation trap, which may have been due to the high flow velocities on our sampling dates. Interestingly, the exponent term in the power model is nearly identical to that for gamma-ray transport, and it's also similar to those of a few other macroinvertebrates. We need to link additional results with those of known juvenile distributions, like those found by Lum and Ackerman in their unpublished work. And our next steps are to conduct additional particle release experiments and compare our results with predictions from mathematical models in order to develop a model for species at risk muscles. We intend to use that model to identify the juvenile muscle habitat for recently existed juveniles, model how processes like increased stream flow affect their transport and settlement, as well as extend the model to other taxa, uh, like other species at risk and invasive species. The two examples here are uh, white sturgeon and Asian carp. I'd like to thank everyone mentioned on this slide, include, including our collaborators from the Food Science Department at the University of Guelph and Dr. Todd Morris from the DFO. Here's our contact information and link to the Physical Ecology Lab website. Thank you.